Welcome to the fifth annual Food Justice Film Festival presented by the Center for Biological Diversity. I'm Linda Rico, Food Justice Film Festival organizer with the Center. I'm so happy to be joined today by Karen Washington, a food justice advocate, organizer, and co-owner and farmer at Rise and Root Farm in Chester, New York. Karen has been instrumental in finding, fighting for food justice in her New York community for many years, as well as highlighting the systemic issues with our food system, even how we talk about it. She even coined the term food apartheid to bring attention to the connections between issues like systemic racism, economic injustice, and neighborhood location that directly fuel inequitable food systems. Welcome, Karen, and thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you, Linda. Thanks for reaching out to me and welcoming me to this space. Of course. Thank you. It's such a pleasure. <laughs> well, I want to jump right in. So for almost 40 years, you have tirelessly fought for food justice in your New York community. You've kept the conversation at the forefront. You've created access to delicious, healthy food by way of the countless and beautiful community gardens that you've helped start. And I wanted to know, when did you first know that this was your life's purpose and how has it fulfilled you? I never knew that I would be a farmer or a gardener. I took the path of least resistance and became a physical <laughs> therapist. I think it wasn't until I moved to the Bronx and I had a backyard that I started to do something about it. I had a big backyard and I, and I always tell this story, it was a tomato that changed my world because I had no idea that it grew on a vine. I didn't know anything about my relationship to food and the earth. And so I was mesmerized by that. And then the fact that it was red because I was used to uh, seeing tomatoes, pink, pale looking, mm -hmm. three in a cellophane package. And so to my surprise, a tomato is really red. Okay. And when I bit <laughs> into it, it just changed my world and I wanted to grow everything. Um, so that I think that's where my passion of growing food began. That is so cool. I love that. It's true because, you know, you see stuff in the store sometimes and it's like, this doesn't look how it's supposed to look. <laughs> um, you, you coined the term food apartheid, uh, which is incredible because it was an effort to steer away from the food term or from the term food desert which doesn't fully recognize the systemic root causes of the problems within our food system or bring attention to connections between uh, these systemic issues like race, uh, the economic injustice, neighborhood location, um, you know, that I mentioned before. But since coining this term, have you found that there's a better understanding between these connections and more realistic solutions being discussed uh, for more marginalized communities? I think it has expanded the conversation because when people were talking about food deserts, first it started with food deserts. And then when people were complaining about food desert, it went to food swamps. And then, you know, it's just like, what? Food desert, food swamps? It's just like crazy. And and, and, food, and food mirage, that did it. It is like, okay, they're not, they're not getting what is truly happening within communities of color. And so um, I really wanted to sort of bring that point home is that if you peel back the food system, everybody knows where the junk food goes. Come on, you know where the junk food goes. Everyone knows where the pristine, uh, organic and healthy food goes. And so I wanted people to say, look, it's time we have starting to start having these hard conversations mm -hmm. because junky food goes into people of color. And when they say, oh, we, you know, that food desert is because there's a lack of food or there's no supermarkets. And it says, yes, no, we have junk food. We have fast food. We have processed food. We don't have healthy food options. I keep talking about this all the time. And so now I'm starting, people are starting to, to talk more about the impact that food has had on marginalized community. Not that it's a desert, which is a location, but the, but the problems that have been happening throughout decades when it comes to food. And so I think it really has sparked a fire. I think people are starting to talk more about, more about food systems and the, fact of, and, and the effect that food has had um, in marginalized communities and communities of color. So hopefully it has sparked that conversation that people are talking, looking at it in terms of race, looking at it in terms of people live in, in and also in terms of the economic and wealth gap that we have in this country. 
Right. A recent study found that red, uh, racially segregated and historically redlined neighborhoods in the U.S. were negatively and disproportionately affected when it came to accessing healthy, fresh food. How has the connection between race and the environment and social status and food shaped the food work you do and the communities that you focus on? You know, for me, it had to start by understanding the history behind uh, growing food in this country. You know, for so long, growing up, you know, as a Black person, food was always connected to slavery. We were brought here because we were dumb and people had to teach us how to grow food. And now here we are. And it's like, no, no, no. If you look at the history of how, how this country was built, it was built on the backs of enslaved and indigenous people. That's number one. We brought our knowledge of agriculture so that we could grow the food to feed this country, yeah. culinary skills, tools, everything we brought. Exactly. And so looking at looking at how the wealth of this country was built on the backs of people of color, again, you have to understand why we are in the predicament we are. There were laws that were passed to keep us down. There were laws that were passed to keep us from gaining any sort of economic wealth. Slavery really, really was the uh, the cutting edge of us not obtaining um, communal wealth. And so now you see the disparities you see when it comes to wealth income. And as a result, that plays into the segregation, the Jim Crow laws, the oppression that we have felt and now is being manufactured, not only in our food, but in our environment and in our health. Right. Exactly. It's, it's a, it's been a terrible system. It's a, a huge part of the work that we do is, is trying to, uh, you know, work with food policy and changing food policy and getting better access to healthy foods, even in schools. Um, you know, just, it, it should be a, a basic right. And it's just very sad how that, narrative has changed so much yeah but you know it's a conversation that we need to have as you know i was doing some research because i was talking at an event yesterday and to come to find out the federal government wage is still seven dollars and ninety cents you know in order for us to think about why is there hunger and poverty because there's this extreme wealth gap people are not making enough money so that they can feed themselves let alone think about uh, housing, you know, think about their medicine, think about all these things. And, and we need to sort of bring that wealth gap into the conversation mm -hmm. because, you know, if you get people out of poverty, then they have a chance to buy healthy food and, 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 and uh, uh, have affordable housing, all these things that we don't talk about, but yet there are people with power over others that don't want to give that power up. And right now you're seeing a climate of the haves and have nots. Mm -hmm. And so if you have people for so long have had power over others, I tell people three things you got to do. Either they got to give it up, they got to share it, or it's going to be taken away. And that's going to be the new revolution because you can, you can, you cannot continue to push people at the brink without them responding negatively. And you don't want to see that to happen. You don't want to see that happening. I just spoke with um, uh, the labor and civil rights activist Dolores Huerta um, on Monday, and she was bringing up this wealth gap also, especially with farm workers and food workers. You know, they're out there picking food. And she said, you know, we pay our firefighters well, we pay teachers, we pay people, these living wages that are civil servants, you know, in the community. And why don't we pay the people that grow our food and pick our food? Up? Yes. They were the essential workers. Hello, during COVID. Exactly. It was, it was, it was plain sight. Mm -hmm. The people that were growing the food, the labor that were in, 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 in warehouses, they were essential to workers, the workers, the farm workers, the farmers, they were essential work in the meatpacking industry. They were essential workers. And right. so what has, what happened? What changed? Exactly. Uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask was, you actually have your own farm now. And um, I'm so interested to hear more about a Rise and Root Farm, a uh, QT BIPOC Center farm rooted in social justice in Chester, New York. And I wanted you to tell me about your farm and how it makes it, uh, how it's so unique from others. 
I love our farm. <laughs> this year we are celebrating our 10th anniversary. And I say that oh, because congratulations. we all came from community gardens in New York City. Yay for community gardens. So cool. Came from community gardens in New York City and we had a dream. And I tell people, if you have a dream, put it out to the universe mm -hmm. because someone will hear it. And we kept on saying that we want land, we want land, we want land. And finally, um, we were given a telephone number. We called the number. There was a new project up in Orange County called the Chester Agricultural Center that were looking for young farmers. Now, I don't know say if I'm, I'm 70 now. Back then I was 60. I don't know <laughs> if they call that young, but I'll take it. And um, yeah, so now, like I said, with this our 10th year, we grow vegetables, we grow herbs, and we feed our community. You know, it's it's so exciting. Mm -hmm. Our community comes and visits. We have community mm -hmm. days. They come and visit. They come and help out. So we never lost our connection mm -hmm. uh, to the people in, in, in New York City and the people who are disenfranchised. So mm -hmm. I'm enjoying it. Um, we, we have a good time. It's hard work. Let me just tell people. Farming is labor intensive and is not for everybody. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, when your body is tired mm -hmm. and your bones ache, and you know, you can sit back and you can look along the horizon and see what you've planted right. um, so that you can bring healthy food and nourishment to people who need it the most. And I think that's that's our motto at, at Rise and Root um, Farm to make sure that everyone has has adequate um, nourishment and then have adequate ac access to the food that we grow. We grow our food organically and it's healthy and it's in a black dirt region. So I'm that's so awesome. blessed to be at Rise and Root. So what is like a, a typical day for you? Oh, getting up early in the morning, getting dressed, going to the farm, looking at what is needed. It changes from season to season in the springtime. You know, you're getting just doing a lot of seeding, a lot of seeding. Mm -hmm. And then by um, end of spring, beginning of, of summer, it's a lot of weeding, weeding and harvesting. Mm -hmm. And so now um, during the summer and fall is getting the product out so that um, it doesn't stay in the ground. So it's harvesting, again, it's weeding. Um, and now we're going towards fall, we're doing the pl um, planting for the fall. Mm -hmm. Uh, harvest so it's it's a continuing work in progress but at the end of the day it's so satisfying that's so great I love that <laughs> and what kind of people uh, go help out the farm is it a lot of youth do you see a lot of um, just people of all ages like what does it look like over there people of all ages and all ethnicity nice. uh, we have school groups we have you know, small as kindergarten has been to our farm, high schools have been to our farm, colleges have come to our farm, uh, community days. We have all types of people. Um, as a matter of fact, we have events as well. As a matter of fact, we just had our third annual Black Farmer Fund event, oh. which was oh, absolutely fabulous. <laughs> and it's a great. day where we bring everybody, you know, people who have supported the work that um, has been done with people of color, the funders, the donors, the farmers, the chefs, you name it, the children, the families, and just celebrate abundance. And I think we tend to look at the work that we do as hard work, uh, you know, uh, in terms of deficit, and we want to bring joy and abundance in the work that we do. And I think having the Black Farmer Fund at our farm uh, for the last three years with that in mind, with that theme of abundance, it's so, so important because sometimes even a daily day work, you know, you, you, you work so hard that you, you forget how joyful it can be. Yes. And if you get that joy to celebrate it. Right. That's so amazing. Sounds like such happy work. <laughs> yes, it can be. I wanted to know too, um, how can we uh, support your work? You know, are there any um, ways to donate or events or, you know, how can we get involved? Well, you know what? I always tell people, think about what you can do locally. Mm -hmm. You know, look at um, communities, especially those communities that have. I always say, you know, there's a lot of people in communities, nonprofits that have a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. And I want them to share Share those resources. If anything I can do, you know, is to get people to start thinking about 
the amount of resources they have, and they know they have sister organizations that are out there that are struggling. You need to share those resources. It could be monetary. It could be the fact that you have a great uh, person that can um, do RFPs. So, you know, have them do uh, RFPs and grants for, for other organizations. Share the grant writers, you know, share what you have. And I think um, that would, that's the message that, that I want to give. I'm, I'm starting to really hone on collaboration and community mm -hmm. because this work is not done by one person. I'm not the only person. I can't do this work alone. Right. And so for me, I do a lot of networking and collaboration. Mm -hmm. And so if people within their community can look around and you know, those organizations that are struggling, help them out, mm -hmm. share the wealth, you know, share what you have so that at the end of the day, what happens is that the whole neighborhood, the whole community benefits. For so long, we've always felt that, oh, we can't give other people because it's it, you're taking away something from me if I give. Whereas, no, if you give to other communities, you yourself are lifted up. So right. that's the message that I would like to give. If you're going to donate, donate within your local community that's and people that, are, that need it the most. Right. Are you currently working with uh, organizations right now in New York or like the surrounding area? Yeah, so um, in November, 1st, 2nd, 3rd is our, gosh, 14th annual Bugs Conference is oh, going to be cool. in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, I also working with an organization called Black Pharma Fund, mm -hmm. where we are funding um, Black businesses, well, businesses of color. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, businesses and farmers uh, so that they can get their feet on the ground and also the products um, into markets. So, and I just uh, received an Emerson Fellowship and oh, my project is the BQE, which stands for BIPOC Queer Expressway. Nice. And it's helping <laughs> farms get their, get their product into lucrative markets. So I'm busy. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> yeah, but I'm enjoying myself trying to make a difference. You know, sometimes you ask, you ask like, why were you, you know, what's your vision? Mm -hmm. What's your dream? Why were you put on this earth? And for me, it's about providing service, Yeah, you know, trying to help people. And I'm humbled by that. Yeah. And I love that you've created such an inclusive space too with your farm, because that really stood out to me. And I, I love to see that, you know, I feel like that's so important because there's so many spaces where people are unsure. And I just love that it was right out there. Like, nope, you're safe here. You yep. know, you can come join us, anybody. Yep. And I, I really love that because it, it truly is what this work is all about. You know, you can't be exclusive. <laughs> We're all trying to right. fight against that, right? Thank you so much for saying that. Yeah. We do a safe space and that's important. Definitely. So I want to know, what does the future of food justice look like to you? Yeah, so I'm really, really excited about the youth movement now. You know, back in the day growing up, I would have never thought I would be a farmer. <laughs> but you have these, the youth now, because if they're so savvy, they're more exposed because of social media. Mm -hmm. And so they're transforming food systems, economic systems, because they have a platform that's no longer local. It's global. Right. And so now information is, is spreading like wildfire. There's, they're mo very involved in uh, the food justice, the economic and um, environmental movements that are happening. And so for me, when people ask me, maybe like 10 years ago, uh, maybe I was on the, uh, on the side of being hopeful, but now I'm very, very hopeful. You know, when I meet so many young people who are enthused, that are, are, are boots on the ground, yeah. want to see a change. They want to see a change in the world, you know, and it's being led by their voices. Yeah. But also it's an intergenerational movement that I like to, because there are the elders that still have the wis wisdom that's out there that right. uh, can provide um, that sort of nudge, that sort of support that our youth needs. And I think that's very, very promising as well. So mm -hmm. I look forward to the next generation. I'm going to just sit back <laughs> and watch them shine. Exactly. And when they say, Mama K, how do you, like, <laughs> how you think I'm doing? I'm going to say, you doing okay, <laughs> you doing right on and continue to do that work. And I think that's for me, that's what it's all about as an elder. It's to step back 
and watch the new generation um, take their place. Yeah, I think that's so cool. I love hearing people's thoughts, especially people that have been in this movement for so long. It's like, I love hearing your thoughts on what does it look like in the future? Because you're there, you know, you're seeing generations come and, and generations go. And it's like, how, you know, what does it look like? How is it changing? And I just think that's so cool because I do think that the youth that are coming up right now are so passionate and they're mm. smart and they're eager and they know that things have to change. You know, they, mm. things just have to change. And so it, it's very exciting. Yep, <laughs> it is. Well, thank you so much. Um, I very much enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much, Karen, for taking time out of your day on the farm and, and with everybody that you're helping um, to speak with us today. Um, and as a reminder to everybody watching, don't forget to sign up for this year's Food Justice Film Festival at foodjusticefilmfestival.com. The festival is totally free to watch all four feature films anytime from October 24th through October 27th. And you can also catch all of our 2024 virtual interviews on our website all year long. So thank you for watching and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Linda. This yeah. Thank you, Karen. Thank <laughs> you.